My name is Carla Wesley. I'm a 36-year-old woman and have been working with the FBI as a supervisory special agent for the past eight years. I have to oversee the activities of other agents, monitor wiretaps and examine the suspect's records, conduct field interviews, etc. Recently, the FBI received a new case related to a serial killer. Up until now, we were not able to figure out who the culprit would be behind these series of murders. So I opened the files of each suspect in this case to cross-examine, to check if we have missed anything. As I was looking through the files, I saw the file of a new suspect in the case that was just admitted to me today. The guy looked familiar to me, so I went through it before others and noticed his past residential address. That was when I remembered where I knew him from. This was about the time when I had just started preparing for the FBI entrance exam after my bachelor's degree was complete. I moved into this neighborhood, which was close to the institute where I was taking classes to prepare for the entrance exam. One day when I was going out jogging in the morning after a light workout, I saw a kid playing in the neighborhood. He must be around the age of 8 or 10. I guessed he might be residing in the house next to mine. I went ahead to jog and returned after an hour or so when I saw there was a rabbit in his yard which he was observing very attentively and closely. Such a cute boy, that's what I thought while looking at him while watching the rabbit curiously and then I went inside. I did some stretching and then went ahead to make a smoothie for myself. As I was making a smoothie, I saw from the kitchen window that the rabbit was lying dead, bleeding and its ears were cut off completely. The scene gave me a scary chill down my spine. I looked around to see the kid, but he wasn't there. No, it cannot be the kid. I guess a dog or cat might have done that, I thought and shook my head. After that, I went back to my daily routine. I took a shower, opened my books and read for about two hours, and then it was time for my classes. I changed my clothes and head out of the house after locking the door, and as I turned, I saw the same kid standing behind me. You are pretty, he said while staring at me. I know it was a compliment and I should feel happy, but for some reason it made me feel uncomfortable, and the look in his eye was as cold as ice. It was as if there was only bare minimum emotions in him. Thank you, kiddo. I said while forcing myself to smile because I felt guilty for thinking that about a kid. The next day when I was going to class, I noticed a dead pigeon and its body looked mutilated. I instinctively looked at the house where that kid lived and then looked at the pigeon again. I shook my head thinking it must be my imagination and then I went ahead toward the institution. I could not focus on anything thinking of the two incidents that had happened the past few days. That was when the lecture snatched my attention toward it because it was related to the study on serial killers. The professor was telling us that some cannot feel many emotions and start killing from a very young age. They start by killing insects, then move on to small animals such as mice, birds, rabbits, etc. and then to a bit bigger animals and then eventually they start killing humans. The next day when I was studying, the doorbell of my house rang. I went ahead and opened it to see it was a lady from the neighborhood. Have you seen a white cat with blue eyes? She looked worried when she was asking me this. No, I haven't seen any cat, sorry. And as I said that, she nodded and started turning in disappointment. What happened? Maybe I can help with something. I felt bad, so I asked if I could help her. I would be very grateful if you can help me look around for her. My cat Dory did not come home this morning when she went for a walk. She always comes back, but it's evening now and I haven't seen her since then. This is a picture of her. I'll share it with you. It would help you recognize her. After saying that, she shared the picture on my phone and we both started to look around the neighborhood for her. For some reason, I was having this bad feeling, and the professor's lecture, those two dead animals, and that kid's thoughts were going on through my mind. That was when I heard that woman scream and immediately ran in her direction. When I reached there, 
I saw she was standing, all panicked near a dumpster. And when I went closer, I saw Dory's body was thrown in there. It was killed brutally, and the killer had sewn her mouth clumsily. It was horrifying to look at. She broke down and started crying right there. The next morning, I saw that kid from my kitchen window. He was burying something, and his hands looked all bloody. I understood what was happening. I closed my kitchen window and went ahead to found on my exercise. The following evening, I heard that the family from the next house moved somewhere else, and someone from the neighborhood was looking for his pet chihuahua. I had made up my mind and was surer than ever that I would become an FBI agent no matter the cost. Hello, I know who the culprit is behind the stitching murders. It's Matthew Arkinson. Yes, I am sure about this, I said after looking at the pictures of him in the file. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. Don't cause any trouble and be nice to your teachers, okay? I instructed my nine-year-old son William while dropping him off at school. Okay, Dad, he replied in a slow voice. I know, kiddo, you have to transfer a lot because of my work, but I promised this time would be different. I tried to assure him but he just nodded and got out of the car. I watched him enter the school building and then left. My cell phone started to ring. I checked and it was the senior officer Mark from the investigation bureau. Yes, Miss Adamson, I answered the call and asked. We have gotten a new clue for the hospital arson case. I think it's someone from the staff, he said. No, I don't think that's the case. The way I see it, I think none of them had a clue about it until the fire spread out, and I couldn't find any motive related to them. No matter what way I look at it, I think it's some kind of terrorist act, I said while taking a right turn from my car. Why would a terrorist perform arson? He asked in a confused tone. Because the casualty risks are higher in hospitals due to patients being in emergency care or being in critical condition. I explained to him calmly. That's when I realized something. Where are you right now? I asked him in a serious tone. I'm at my office, but I was about to head out to meet the victim's families. Why are you asking? No, don't leave the office. I'm heading there right away. And you have the case files for arson that you took for the past three years, right? As I said that, I turned my car in the direction of the investigator Mark's office. Why am I getting the feeling you just realized something related to the case? He asked. It seemed he got confused by my sudden tone change. Don't worry, I won't make you spend your entire day with me this time. It's just that I realize a pattern connecting this to a past few cases, I told him, and sped up the car. I reached his office, parked the car in the parking area, and got out. I looked around for a bit, and then walked inside his office. He had already picked out the files that were related to the past few arson cases. These are the spare keys to my office. Take these, and when you are done, then lock my office and take them with you, he said while stretching his left hand toward me in which he grabbed the keys. And where do you think you're going? I asked him. He flinched, looked over at me with raised eyebrows, and said, Didn't you say that you won't make me spend your entire day with you? I did not lie about that. You won't be spending your entire day with me, I said while smiling. No, no, I won't spend my day here at all, he said while being nervous. I looked at him with a smile and handed him a file. He looked at me with a defeated look and took the file, surrendering his protest. So, what are we trying to look at here, he asked while turning the pages of the file. We are trying to find a pattern in these arson cases, and if you find any similar pattern in any of these cases, just hand it to me," I said while going through the arson case that happened four weeks ago in an orphanage. The timing and the day were the same as the case of the hospital. This is weird. The time and the weekday are the same as the case in the hospital, but unlike the other two, this one was performed at 427 in the evening instead of the morning like the other two cases. He said while handing me the file of the arson case in the old age home. 
There is another thing. These arsons are performed in the places that have the highest rate of casualties. Look at this. The first arson that was performed was at the orphanage. The second was the asylum. The third was at an old age home. And the last one is the hospital. And all of them were caused by two week gaps between them. Open the city map and mark all these locations. I handed him the map while looking over the details once more to see if we missed something. Hey Dan, I was focused on the files when Adamson called for me. What is it? I turned my face to see him looking nervously, and when I looked at where he was pointing on the map and saw that the arson locations were all almost at the border of the town, slowly forming a semicircle trying to surround the city. I could not understand the reason behind it, but each of them was at the exact distance of 3.4 kilometers. So the next possible target could be this, I said while pointing at the NGO, while Adamson pointed at the school where my son was studying. I carefully calculated again, and he was right. It could be any of these, because he started from the middle. Except for the time and weekday where there wasn't anything fixed, and if we were correct, then the next attack was supposed to happen tomorrow. I immediately called the FBI office and informed them about everything and the possible attack locations as well. After that, I took the file and left. Investigator Adamson worked with me on several cases, so he knew that this was supposed to be a secret mission. By the time I reached the office, Fellow agents who were working on the case had already managed to bring in the footage of those places before the arson. We worked all night to find any suspicious person in them, and it was almost four in the morning when I noticed there was one person who was present in all those places around that time. We checked the footage for the past week before the arson, and he was there three days in a row in each of them. I looked at him closely because he seemed familiar to me. That was when I remembered that I saw him at the gate of the school dressed as the guard. I act quickly and warned everyone about the arsonist. A team was sent out the next day and we captured him while he was still acting as a guard and it all happened suddenly before he could conduct the act of arson. After that, we arrested him for arson and put him in for questioning because I was sure he was not the mastermind behind all of this. As he was being questioned, I decided to change my plans for retirement because I needed to protect my son and other kids like him from the likes of these people. Our organization had everything we ever needed. We had great business, it was thriving, and we were making a whole lot of money than we ever had made. There are different businesses that we had. There were the multiple dry cleaning businesses, and then there were the other businesses of dry cleaners, lottery tickets, and the underground casino in the Chinatown. The business was started by my uncle, and he taught me everything I knew about the business, and I started taking care of him when he got older and couldn't handle the pressure that came with the old age, and I was the one to step in and take charge of the business. I was 18 when I took over the businesses, and with my education, I knew how to deal with the business things and how to make everything better and even establish diplomatic relationships with people that could help me be better at the business that I was doing. My work was to make sure that our business get even better, and I tried to make the business much better on paper and it was getting better. But the thing with it getting better is that it was also getting bigger. And though bigger is mostly better, this time it wasn't better. The bigger the business gets, the more eyes are on it. And the more eyes it has, the more careful I have to be. And that was something that I was keeping my eyes at. Our businesses were expanding to outside of the boundaries and limits of the Chinatown and breaking towards exports and imports, and it was then that it started the eyes of the vultures were lurking upon the empire of businesses that I was creating. It was the FBI. The FBI was getting their sucking eyes on our business, and that was definitely not worth the trouble that would later on follow. I call the FBI the vultures. Now, if they had any sense of justice, they would just punish or do the right thing, as justice thinks it is. 
but there is so much more to these vultures. They just don't want you to see behind the bars. They also want part of your businesses. They want more, and they will play with you as long as they need is saved. So I had to take care of these vultures, and in order to take care of these vultures, I had to make sure that they would get off of my back. But to do that, I had to make sure that I was getting them just the things that I wanted them to feed, and not everything else. I made sure all the covered or the dark side of the business stays hidden, so I had people all over the places, people who would tell me if everything moved without the right intention in my business. While the FBI was behind me, I got the information that they were planning on setting me up and trying me to get the blame of things, and the first thing of the business is to take care of the people that are trying to harm your business, and the FBI was not my friend, not until some years later. One of the people told me that I had a mole in the organization, a free spirit that was feeding information to FBI. And so I started the conversation, and people at the FBI were ready to pin me down on the coming Wednesday. It was pretty certain that was bound to happen, so I waited my time to plan my moves. I knew the events and how they were to happen. I did my research just like the FBI did. I knew everyone. I knew every agent that was there in the room that were going to assemble to get me down. But the cards were something that they didn't know about. The wild cards. And I entered. And I knew the room was wired, so knowing that, the place will be the place where they pin me down. I entered and said, If you gentlemen would follow me to another room, that would be nice. And I left the room. And the men followed. And then we walked across the road and reached the warehouse. And as they entered, they could see some people tied up. And they saw it. And it was their family members. They were all tied up and their mouths were shut. And then I said, Well, gentlemen, lovely family you have there. It's nice to have such lovely families. Someone to share memories and life and business with. Things we do for the family. Well, here's the options. Let me clear them out for you because it is the last time that these options will be out for you. So here's the deal. You tell them boys at FBI you got nothing on me, and I will let them all be. But they stay safe as long as FBI stays off my back. But if something happens to me and the FBI is involved, let me tell you, these people will not get the treatment they are getting now. So let us all get one thing clear. These people will be released when I have my files over here and FBI have taken away the vultures, and most importantly, I have an information for your head there's something private. Get him and get off. And that cold, long, one-sided conversation was enough for me to get the FBI off my back. But then I had things over a really important person that hangs out in the Oval Office. Something that happened between him and Lu Xiang in the Chinese bar once. FBI were quick to realize that I was left alone. And then as I said FBI were back years later, this time, they wanted my help rather than getting me behind the bars. If I said to you, Madeline Columbia, what do you think of? Pre-2015, only a handful of people would have given the answer that is commonplace today. But since that narco show was on TV, Almost everyone knows what Madeline is famous for, and that's for being the home of the Madeline Cartel, added up by the one and only Pablo Escobar. These days, the Madeline Cartel are confined to the history books, but the legacy of violence lives on in the city, and the problems didn't exactly die along with Escobar when the law caught up with him in 93. So it's there, in the city of Madeline, that I met a girl named Stephanie while I was traveling around South America. Steph was from Canada on a similar sort of rolling vacation as I was, and there was this almost instant chemistry between us that ended with me asking her out. We drank cheap Colombian beers, compared traveling tattoos. She definitely won with her traditional tippy-tap Filipino tribal piece, and generally just had ourselves a great time. But when it came to the end of the night, we were put in a rather precarious situation. You see, that old legacy of violence and suspicion means that in a city like Madeline, you can't get anywhere without the right credentials. 
and as a result, neither of us were allowed any guests in our respective hostels. So we thought on our feet and decided the night was warm enough for us to spend it in one of Madeline's public parks. So we spot what seemed like a nice enough place to lay down. Only as we're walking over, we see these four Colombian guys hanging out on a bench. No reason to be suspicious, right? I mean, it was a nice enough night, and the South American idea of a late night is totally different to ours, so not everyone hanging out past midnight is some kind of reprobate. I suppose that goes for the states too, but I digress. So me and Steph are sitting there for a few minutes, when one of the guys from the bench comes over to talk to us. My Spanish is still an embarrassingly dire at that time, but I knew enough to know that he was asking for a cigarette. I told him, I don't smoke, no fumo lo siento. But he carried on asking for stuff like money, then other things with words I didn't understand. I kept saying, lo siento, lo siento, tengo nada, tengo nada but he just won't give it up. He kept talking to us, then spits out something mean sounding in Steph's direction. So at that point, I really take issue, and I have enough Dutch courage to tell him to get F before I leave Steph off to another spot further away from them. I'll spare you the finer details of what followed, but needless to say, Steph and I ended up having a little cuddle, shall we say, until we heard and saw something that almost scared us half to death. A police siren and flashing lights, and it was just a few feet away near the boundary of the parkland. Steph quickly pulled her dress back on, and we attempted to make ourselves as presentable as possible. As the cop car screeches to a halt, two guys jump out, and they come jogging over to us. How they knew we were there, I don't know but I figured the guy asking for smokes had called them and has a kind of screw you for not being generous to us. I'm on the verge of a full-on freakout, as all I can think is, I'm going to end up in a Colombian jail, and that's going to be the end of it for me. Colombia has some of the worst prisons in all of South America, and to no offense to our Latin cousins, but that's really saying something. What's worse, I didn't have the money to pay a fine or a bribe, so there was absolutely zero chance of me talking my way out of it. But still, I didn't really have a choice. The best I could hope for was to pull off a speech skill 100. So I got down to it. As this little Colombian cop, I don't even say that to be me, the guy was literally no smaller than 5'4", is shining his flashlight in my face. I'm just pouring this stream of bilingual apologetic consciousness that probably sounded something like, Dude, lo siento, seriously, no borrachos, han cansado, just tired, I'm sorry, I swear to God. What all the cop does is scold us in Spanish, talking so fast that I can barely understand a word. Steph is like welling up with tears at this point, as she's too obviously thinks she's about to be arrested. All I could do was shut up and let the cop burn off whatever angry energy he had, and just pray he didn't drag us both off to jail there and then. I just hit him with, lo siento, no entiendo until he finally kind of calms down and pulls a smartphone out of his police vest thing. When I see he's pulling up Google Translate, I know something isn't quite right. If he really was just going to throw the cuffs on us, he'd have done it already, right? So what are we about to type out? I'd never forget what came next and how I foolishly tried to anticipate his words without stopping to consider the context. First thing he typed was translated, these men and pointed over to where the cigarette guy and his friends had been. I look over expecting to see them looking all smug, but there's no one there. And it dawns on me that they'd beat feet as soon as they'd seen the cops arrive. I go to say something like, yeah, I know, they called you, I'm sorry. But the cop cuts me off with a little sock puppet hand gesture, clamping the thing's mouth shut as if to stay quiet. So I do as I'm told and carry on watching him type. These men, he continued, are very dangerous. You must leave now or they will come back. And the cop stopped for a second, like he was trying to find the right words, then wrote, they will come back and violate the girl, understand? 
my chin is dusting the floor at this point. Like, I had no idea we were in that much danger. And right before I can say anything, the guy types, they are known to us. They have done things before. They will do things again. Again, we just nod, too stunned by how dumb we'd been to really be relieved that we weren't in any trouble. The cop then types out, don't come back here during the night again, shows us the message, then escorts us to the well-lit street nearby. As you can imagine, that whole thing really killed the mood, and even though I walked Steph back to her hostel, there was never any talk of me getting inside to continue where we left off. I saw her a few more times before she moved on to Argentina, and yes, we did conclude some of the unfinished business, even kept in touch for a while after I returned to the US. But you can bet your bottom dollar I didn't go anywhere near any poorly lit places in Madeline, not for the remainder of my stay. I learned my lesson, and I learned it good.